Welcome. Welcome to this webinar where we will address the issue of new incentives for the development of new effective antibiotics. My name is Göran Hägglund. I will use a few minutes uh, to give a background to the topic of this webinar. After that, we will have the opportunity to listen to four experienced and committed people who, from slightly different starting points, give their views on how we can move forward. Once again, welcome. Antimicrobial resistance, AMR, serious threat to the, uh, that requires global collaboration. AMR has been declared by the World Health Organization as one of the top global public health threats facing humanity. AMR not only increases the risk of serious illness and death from infections, effective antimicrobial drugs are a prerequisite for modern health care. Without access to effective antibiotics, advanced cancer treatment will not be possible, a simple knee surgery cannot be performed, a neonatal hospital care would be jeopardized, AMR is thus a top pharmaceutical challenge and the pharmaceutical industry must join forces with other actors to stop this silent pandemic. The need for new antimicrobial drugs is huge, but paradoxically far too few new antibiotics reach the markets as approved drugs. There are several challenges along the way, ranging uh, from the fact that it is scientifically difficult to find new mechanisms of actions to challenges in conducting clinical drug trials for antibiotics. If an uh, innovator succeeds to make the way through the preclinical pre and clinical development phase and receives a market approval, the challenges remains that the current business model make it un unprofitable for research companies to invest in such development. In 2009, as the Swedish Minister for Health and Social Affairs, mm -hmm. I put a need for new incentives for the development of new antibiotics on the agenda for EU's health ministers. Now, 14 years later, 14 years later, I'm pleased that the Swedish government come back to the issue. It is time for Europe to show leadership. FPA and LIF Sweden organizes today today's joint webinar to discuss the need for new incentives and way forward in Europe. We will initially be hearing, uh, uh, hearing of financial and commercial barriers for bringing new antibiotics to the market, both from the SME perspective as well as the global biopharma perspective. Presenting us the SME perspective will be Christian Gröndahl uh, from Sniper and the perspective from Global Biopharma is presented by Andrea Chiarello from Pfizer. We will then hear um, more on new incentive models needed. Kevin Utterson from CarbX will explain why antibacterial uh, R&D urgently requires both push and pull incentives. And we will, prior to the panel discussion, hear Christine Pierce from the European Federation of Pharmaceutical Industries and Associations, uh, FPA, discuss the opportunities for Europe to lead the way forward with concrete actions. I would now uh, like to give uh, or invite Christian Gröndahl from Sniper uh, to the stage to give uh, us his take on the topic we discussed today. Please, Christian. Thank you, Joran. So my name is uh, Christian Gröndahl, and uh, I'm the co-founder and CEO of a, a CRISPR company uh, that are actually trying to make two types of medicine. One where we are targeting AMR and selectively kill bacteria by cutting in their genes. And we also have then use CRISPR technology to do gene therapy to, you know, to combat uh, cancer and uh, metabolic uh, disorders. 
We are a very young company. Uh, we have only been going for five, six years. And uh, we did raise the biggest uh, Series A in Scandinavia back in 2019, when we were only eight scientists, and we raised 50, 50 million US dollars uh, from uh, European venture capital. We have used that uh, fund to build an excellent team uh, coming from all over the world. We, we are a team of 50 scientists coming from 25 nations, and I'm very proud of that team. I'm actually also very proud that we are having our first two CRISPR medicines into the area of uh, AMR. Right now, we are in clinical trials in the US where we are using our first CRISPR medicine, which is uh, four live uh, viruses that are uh, CRISPR-armed to tackle one of the most uh, dangerous uh, multidrug-resistant uh, infections. It's uh, E. coli, and it's also in some of the most vulnerable patients, the cancer patients, especially the hematological cancer patients. So we are actually the only uh, biotech company in Scandinavia uh, that has been awarded a grant from, uh, from CAPEX. CAPEX uh, is a non-profit uh, organization that was actually the brainchild of former uh, President Barack Obama, and they support innovation and uh, development on completely new antibiotics. Right now, I am out raising my next fundraise, and I'm aiming to raise a quite substantial fund of money, uh, 60 to 80 million US dollars, and that is actually quite challenging, mainly because our first two drugs are focusing on AMR. I've been speaking over the last year to more than 200 venture capital firms in US and in Europe, and for more than 95% of them, the message is more or less the same. They love the CRISPR technology, they love the fact that we have built such a strong team, and they also think it's very, very cool how we can, by cutting in the bacterial gene, can surpass all the known resistor mechanisms, and we can actually target more than 90% of the multidrug resistant E. coli. They do acknowledge that uh, our approach to AMR is super cool, to use the, the CRISPR technology to selectively kill one bacteria and leaving all the good bacteria uh, alone and uh, intact. And conceptually, the venture capitalists also recognize the size of the opportunity. However, importantly, they cannot invest in our uh, company because they don't want to be exposed to the whole area of infectious diseases and new an antibiotics because they recognize that the business model is totally broken and they cannot see a path to their classical expected venture return. I am in dialogue with a few uh, very long-term investors and impact investors who realize the huge unmet medical need that AMR is presenting to all of us and how many lives our CRISPR medicine potentially could save in the future. But then you have to have a perspective of value generation for maybe 10 or 15 years, uh, just as our largest uh, shareholder, the, the, the Medical Foundation, Lundbeck Foundation, has uh, in, uh, in this long-term uh, you know, push for, for innovation in this area. So innovative companies like Sniper or everybody else that want to make innovation in AMR urgently need both push and pull incentives for us to become investable by the wider venture capital community. And it's so urgently important that there's not only a, a couple of handfuls, but there are hundreds of biotech companies like Sniper that are actually trying to do discovery in completely new antibiotics that we will all need to access in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christian. Um, uh, just a few questions. Um, if we uh, want new antibiotics uh, coming to the market, uh, what kind of role do you think that small and medium-sized businesses can, can play? Isn't this an arena for the big farmers or, or does the small and medium-sized uh, businesses have a role to play? Well, you know, typically the very cutting edge, uh, you know, technology and, and science advancements comes from the very small company. Look at the, the COVID pandemic we just went through. The real innovation, the, 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 the vaccines that really pulled us through, they came from biotech. They came from Moderna, they came from BioNTech. And then, of course, the, in partnership with the big pharma, with their huge uh, production machinery, we could have this very, very fast development of the COVID vaccines. So you typically see that the cutting edge in new medicines comes from, uh, uh, from academia and from small uh, venture-backed uh, biotech. And that pushes the boundaries. 
And another example is, you know, in dialogue with some very large and, and, and great companies like Pfizer, they no longer have uh, the four or 500 scientists in research they used to have. They have the people in development and production, so they leave it to us. They, they typically, when we talk to them, they say it's on your watch to bring it the first four or five years into the clinic, show it works, then we have people to take it on. But we cannot partner with you in the very early stages mm. because we no longer have those scientists. Yeah. You have already touched upon this, but, but uh, uh, the conditions for you today, when it comes to what we're talking about today, seems to be very difficult to find the right capital for, for raising money, for, for doing what you want to do. Uh, are there anything, who can change that and, and, uh, who, uh, and what do you want to see changed? Yeah, so first of all, we've got a very, very meaningful contribution from CAPEX, up to 10 million US dollars, and we, we can probably rely on having other soft funding or governmental funding or foundation funding to support us, and that is very important. But the, 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 the bigger, more effective thing will be that we become uh, venture investable, and there is actually a market pool, mm -hmm. and it's recognized that safe and efficacious antibiotics is a common good for all of us. So some of the suggestions to actually have uh, uh, you know, incentives that, uh, that, that gives us uh, uh, a possibility to, uh, for, for a patent extension for six or 12 months and we can transfer that would be a fantastic incentive that venture capital immediately would know how to price in and then suddenly we will become uh, in investable. But I will say uh, many investors are saying to me, are you suicidal? Why have you put your first two uh, uh, you know, uh, medicinal products into AMR? Why aren't you focusing on oncology or gene therapy where you know you can be in, in, you know, in, invested in? And we actually think, first of all, the CRISPR technology is super well suited for this, but also uh, you know, in time, this will be a very, very important medicine and it will also actually you know, generate a lot of value, both for us and for society. So therefore, we think it's the right thing to do. But of course, you know, only in so much that we can be invested into. Mm. And if you uh, could um, uh, make an, an uh, wish list for, for, um, against the politicians, what, what would you like from the politicians? To, to comfort your, your work? Well, it's not that difficult because the politicians have done it before. Mm -hmm. We had a lack of innovation in pediatric uh, medicines, uh, in rare diseases, mm -hmm. uh, in uh, diseases in, uh, in low and middle income countries. And we, we had then very well functioning mechanisms like priority vouchers, where you could get a piece of paper and your, uh, you know, your medical drug application could then get a priority review and it could go much faster. That could be transferred and then you could sell that to a, a large company that needed uh, to come uh, you know, much faster to the, to the market for commercial reasons. Uh, a similar uh, structure, you know, either with, with these priority vouchers or, as I mentioned before, if there was the contract between the innovators and society that you could have you know, six or 12 months uh, you know, extension of your patent. A patent is already a contract between innovators and society. That would be a huge title uh, you know, change in the attractiveness of this area. Mm. Can, can you see any differences between different countries or is uh, the conditions you have in Denmark, are they the same in, in all Europe or, or in, in the world as, as a whole? I mean, you could ask why is the, why is the market uh, broken? And the, the market is broken because most of the very large pharma companies, they had a very thriving business in the 60s, in the 70s, in the 80s, making a lot of very well functioning and broader and broader spectrum of antibiotics. They all made you know, very good business and they actually provided very, very life-saving and useful medicines. Mm -hmm. Now, typically in most markets, you have, I don't know, maybe more than 200 different antibiotics. They are all off patent, they are all generic, as we call them, mm. and they cost next to nothing. Mm. It's still the class of medicines that are enjoying the most prescriptions. Mm. I think in UK, with 60 million people, there is more than 4 mil uh, 40 million uh, uh, no prescriptions. Completely new antibiotic into that market that has costed you know, a couple of billions to make you have to have a price to recoup that back. And of course also the, the very sensible you know, physicians will use it as a last resort. In a consequence, such a new a newly launched drug will only be used on a very rainy Monday for you know, neonatal sepsis and consequently the top line will be very low. Mm -hmm. 
And but there's already models to actually uh, you know address that the uh, uh, subscription model or so-called adopt the Netflix model, which is pioneered by UK and now also in Sweden. Uh, I think you know some of those ideas would be very helpful. So I think my wish to the politician is really to to treat uh, treat this as as a security threat, as, as a societal investment, just as you have, you have a fire brigade, you have your military, you actually also want to have safe and efficacious antibiotics. Because as you said, Joran, that's the foundation for all modern medicine, whether it's cancer treatment, cesarean sections, a knee operation, we, we cannot do without antibiotics. Well, then we can go back to, to, the, to the days of the 1800s, and we didn't want to do that. You don't want Thank you very much so far, and you will come, come back, of course. Um, and I will now give the floor to Andrea Chiarello, uh, representing Pfizer, uh, just now in Brussels, Belgium. The floor is yours, please, uh, please, uh, Andrea. Thank you very much and good afternoon, everybody. I am Andrea Chiarello, uh, Head of EU Government Affairs for Pfizer. Uh, I would like to start perhaps by stating uh, Pfizer's continued commitment to contribute to the fight against uh, antimicrobial resistance. Pfizer's legacy in infectious disease uh, runs deep. Uh, our first anti-infectives uh, date back to the 1849. Today, Pfizer is one of the few large research-based pharmaceutical companies still active in R&D for anti-infectives. And we are proud to have developed one of the industry's largest and most diverse anti-infective portfolio. We are also proud to be recognized by independent institutions as a global leader in tackling AMR from several perspectives, from our work on stewardship to our surveillance platform, Atlas, infection prevention, responsible manufacturing, and of course our contribution, as is the case today, to the policy debate around robust, sustainable, and predictable R&D incentives. It was already said, but I'll repeat, AMR is a global public health crisis, and in Europe it takes already 33,000 lives every year, and it costs 1.1 billion euro to the economy. While the unmet medical need is clear, developing new treatments for bacterial and fungal infections uh, is becoming increasingly difficult. No novel class of gram-negative antibiotics has been approved for human use in almost 40 years. The pipeline is incredibly thin, with only 40 to 50 antibiotics in clinical development at present, compared to the thousands of potential therapies in other areas like oncology. The current pipeline is even smaller when we look at the limited number of medicines in development targeting the WHO priority pathogen list. Taken together, the rate of innovation is clearly insufficient to meet current and future needs of patients and the societies. At Pfizer, we of course strive to address unmet medical need in a wide range of therapy areas. Our R&D commitment to anti-infectives focuses predominantly on interventions to either help prevent or treat multi-drug resistant bacterial and fungal infections that are considered priorities by the WHO and the US CDC. There are currently, as it was already said, very few incentives for venture capital, small biotechs, and global pharmaceutical companies to invest in R&D for antimicrobials. The market potential is very limited due to several coexisting factors. For example, the steep costs of antimicrobial development. Accounting for the failures, it costs over $1.4 billion to successfully launch a new product. Adding to this, the cost of capital brings the total costs to bring a single new antibiotic from discovery to launch to over $3.1 billion. Secondly, the high risk of failure. On average, only 4% of molecules from discovery are approved and launched, according to the literature. Thirdly, undervaluation. This is very important. Traditional HTA for antibiotics does not properly recognize their full societal value. This has led to undervaluation of this new option needed to combat AMR, especially given the availability of widespread inexpensive antibiotics as clinical comparators. The need to keep usage at the minimum to ensure stewardship is another factor that needs to be taken into account. And the combination of these development and commercial challenges makes therefore investing in antimicrobial R&D especially difficult and extremely risky. This myriad of issues has led to fewer and fewer companies investing. Around 18 large pharma companies were actively engaged in R&D globally in the 90s. And by 2013, this number had decreased to just four. 
for a company our size, you may understand there is a competition within our own portfolio on where to place our future investments. Our investment decisions tend to be focused on medical need, the maturity of the science to address this need, and finally, whether a tangible commercial opportunity exists. The best way to convince companies and investors to allocate more capital into anti-infective R&D, including Pfizer, is for governments and all stakeholders to prioritize and advance the incentives needed to reinvigorate the pipeline by finally addressing what has become an overall extremely challenging commercial environment. As Kevin will explain in more detail later, there is an urgent need for a package of push and pull incentives coupled with national level reimbursement reforms if we are to reinvigorate this pipeline. The gap in Europe, in our view, is especially on pull incentives that reward successful development of priority antimicrobial, antimicrobials. And this is something that Christine will elaborate on further. Pfizer is, also, Pfizer is also proud to have pledged the $100 million to the AMR Action Fund, a groundbreaking collaboration of more than 20 pharma companies, philanthropies, development banks, multilateral organizations, and other partners to bring two to four new antibiotics to patients by 2030. Despite this remarkable initiative, however, we knew from the start that such a fund would not be a sustainable long-term solution, but rather a bridge until a robust package of push and pull incentives would be put in place. I therefore look forward to leaving the floor to my colleagues, Kevin and Christine, to discuss more in detail what these incentives may look like. Thank you so much for your attention and looking forward to the Q&A. Thank you very much, Andrea. Um, we're very happy for your intervention and uh, I think it is very useful. Do you think what you uh, just told us uh, would your colleagues on other companies give the same, as you think, uh, give the same picture of the situation right, right now? Or is it a, a company-specific description you, you gave us? No, definitely the industry, by the way, small and large companies, is definitely united on this assessment of the situation, as well as on recommendations for the future. We have seen our colleague from an SME perspective just before me. You have, you have, you have heard me as well. You'll hear Christine later from FBA. It's really a unanimous call for action, uh, as urgent uh, as possible. And it was also recognized by policymaker and several other non-industry stakeholders. I mean, how, how urgent it is to, to act all together at the global stage. But here we are speaking especially about Europe. To, to address this commercial failure in this area. Hmm. Uh, I just want to tell everyone that you have the opportunity to, uh, through the chat, uh, put forward some questions and I will get them here uh, and have the opportunity to, to, uh, to put them uh, to our speakers here. So please, uh, if you have questions, write, write, write. I will take care of them. Uh, Andrea, what if if the politicians uh, could make a decision, let's say, uh, uh, right now, uh, what is the perspective, uh, uh, do you think? Uh, uh, what will happen then? If we could have a new order uh, in, in place now, how long will it take before we could see any results? Thank you for the question. And this is very important indeed to put this into perspective because uh, any measure that might be applicable as of tomorrow will not lead to immediate results. Antimicrobial R&D, but in general also pharmaceutical R&D is a process that doesn't uh, switch on and off like a light switch, but it takes decades. Uh, and so there are several promising programs in clinic, preclinical, clinical, even advanced clinical development right now that could perhaps benefit from uh, a better incentives framework and therefore in the next few years indeed have a sustainable marketplace where these products that are essential for in all area of, of medicine and of health could be already used and sustainably supplied to, to patients that need them. But in order for us to achieve our objective as society, which is to have this ecosystem and this uh, generation and revitalized pipeline, this is a process that definitely will take decades and it, and it will be definitely an uphill battle because as, as we were saying before, apart from the huge commercial challenges, there are also scientific and regulatory challenges that are specific to this area of, of products. 
Thank you very much, Andrea. Uh, we will come back later to you in the panel. Uh, thank you so far. Uh, I will now welcome Kevin Utterson from CarbX. Uh, please, the stage is yours, please. Well, I, I thank you for inviting me to this. I remember the uh, amazing work that was done the last time we had a Swedish presidency, and, uh, and I hope that uh, we continue that now. And so I'm going to talk about both push and pull incentives and why we need both. And just to emphasize, even though I lead CarbEx, what I'm saying today doesn't necessarily represent the governments or the foundations that support us uh, or really any uh, pharmaceutical company, because I never take money uh, from the industry. I'm an academic uh, in today's presentation. So let's talk about push and pull incentives and, and what we need. So this is, a, you know, at the bottom, start at the bottom, look at that number six. If your goal, if society's goal is that we want six highly impactful new antibiotics per decade, okay, uh, what does it take to get that? And starting all the way at the top, it's thousands of basic research projects. You know, here we've estimated 6,000. These are, you know, projects in university laboratories all around the world. And, and then going down the funnel, um, you know, in the preclinical stages, think about hit to lead when you have yeah, you know, a series of of, uh, of of chemistry that you think, you know, might develop into a single molecule that you want to take forward. Uh, you need about 215 of those projects, and then looking further down, uh, about 12. And you know, notice the tilde. There's a range here, projects that are starting, ready to start phase two, if the goal at the end of the day is six. So, if what you want is new antibiotics, there's a lot that has to happen. And on the left, you see. Uh, our estimates based on my published work on how much money is required to get there, uh, 3 billion in basic research and 5.6 in early product stage development, 3.3 uh, in the late product stage development. And then on top of this, pull incentives are not on this slide. So this is just on the push incentive side. Uh, on the far right, you see the arrow, and that's how long it takes. Um, and, and this again, the clinical data is rock solid uh, from the FDA and the preclinical data I think is very good as well. Um, we're working today at CarbEx on the antibiotics that we'll need in 2035, right? So this slide compares the numbers that I just showed you uh, on what is needed, and that's over here on the right, uh, the 3 billion, 5.6, 3.3. And then on the left is data from the global R&D hub in Berlin, uh, which uh, has broad membership from across the foundations in the G20. And this is what they think at this time, how much money is actually being spent in each of these three groupings, okay? So you see a small deficiency in basic research, but we've done a pretty good job. And I can say from the vantage point of CarbEx that there's amazing science coming out with companies like Sniper as one example, but many others. And the barrier is economic, not scientific, because of all of the excellent investment made in basic research over many decades. There's a large funding gap in the, in the middle part, and there's also a funding gap uh, for the advanced clinical development as well, but it's not as large as the funding gap for the preclinical space. This can be called the, the valley of death, and we heard from Sniper earlier that this is where it's really difficult to raise money uh, because private investors don't see a potential return here. And uh, and so we've got a problem in terms of push incentives globally. Now, CarbEx, these are the, the folks that fund us. We're a nonprofit. I'm not going to say too much about us, but just to say that in the time that we've been around, which is since 2016, our first funding was made in 2017, we are entirely nonprofit. Uh, in that time, we've had 18 projects actually initiate first in human, 10 therapeutics, four diagnostics, for vaccines or other prevention technologies. The science is there when the money is made available. But these companies, when they get to the end of the CARVAC scope, because we end at the end of phase one, they're asking, how can I raise the money to do these phase two human trials? That's the question that many companies are facing. And pull incentives uh, are part of the answer to that equation. So, you know, CARVAC is, uh, is actually asking the European Commission uh, for funding for Europe to join CARBEX. Currently, we're funded by the U.S., the U.K., and Germany, but for the commission itself to join, we think this complements other activities and other work in Europe and would complete uh, the, the, 
push incentive side of the equation uh, that you see here. Let's talk about pull incentives. This is a slide from from React uh, from Sweden. Uh, you know, I think of all the leadership of many years of Professor Udo Kars uh, from Uppsala, and uh, and this comes from the group that he founded. We need to pay for antibiotics in a different way. You know, delinked from the volume, let's pay for the value to society. The companies no longer will have an incentive to overmarket. We get the antibiotics we want. We're protected in the future. And I have to say that anytime you can get consensus on a slide like this from public health advocates and from people that have worked in this area for years as clinicians, uh, from academics like myself, as well as industry, uh, that's an idea that's worth taking notice of because there's a lot of consensus that we need a delinked pull incentive around the world. And, uh, and so the question is, what is it going to look like in Europe? So I'm going to focus my time uh, today on how large it should be. There are, are other questions one can ask about a European pool incentive, but my question is how large. And I published uh, this paper in 2021 in Health Affairs, which is the leading health policy journal published in the United States, uh, with uh, all the data uh, that I could find and, and uh, made it as transparent as possible. But I've made an estimate here of 3.1 billion is the size of a global subscription. So if the UK took their subscription program and made it global, how large would it need to be? So the US is thinking about the Pasteur Act, Canada is evaluating a pull incentive we heard this week from Japan. The question is, what will Europe do? And my question today is, how large does it need to be? Okay. So my fair share of methodology, I presented this actually in November of last year at, at a health technology assessment conference in Vienna. Uh, that presentation is available, but I've cut it down today on the basis of time. Uh, but I've taken my data based on GDP data from the OECD, and I've asked what would Europe, European Commission, EU 27, EU 27 uh, how much should they need to contribute uh, to reach this $3.1 billion global target? And so if the uh, denominator is uh, G7 plus EU 27 and the numerator is, is, is uh, just Europe 27, then Europe's percentage is 39.1% of the total which leads to this uh, figure here. And notice that there's a range here for fully delinked, that would be a subscription model, which is where most of the policy is focusing on. As low as 86 million, as high as 187 million, 0.9, 188. But the, the average value uh, should be 121 million over, over a period of time per drug per year, it would be the European pool incentive amount. Uh, in the U.S., the, the number is, is, is larger. In the U.K., the number is smaller relative to the size of the economy. Now, I just want to note um, that Sweden does have an access uh, uh, in, you know, incentive, uh, which has been successful in bringing five or six uh, antibiotics to Sweden that were not otherwise available, that were available in other parts of Europe and not in Sweden. The amount of this is really quite small. It's designed not to initiate new R&D, but to get access to drugs that are already available in the rest of Europe. If Sweden alone on its own did a pool incentive on, on my model, they would need to be paying $2.9 million per drug per year, which is substantially more than the access incentive is today. And this is my last slide. I wanna say you can see sniper biome on the top row here. Uh, that was not done on purpose. The, the great bulk of the global innovation here is in small companies. Um, we have sifted a Carbex through over 1,200 applications and to date have funded only 91 companies. And each one of these gets substantial support from Carbex, uh, multiple millions of dollars. Uh, this is the place where the science has come out of our universities and is ready to move forward. Carbex is moving it forward to the, so that they're ready for clinical trials. We need HERA and, and others to, to step in to make sure that there's funding for those clinical trials. But a pool incentive would mean now that there's there would be private investment again in this space. And these companies would go out and talk to investors. And, and instead of talking to 100 or 200 of them and get, getting lots of polite or impolite no's, they would actually have fruitful conversations about investment. And that is what pool incentive will get us. So thank you for your time. 
Thank you very much, uh, Kevin. <coughs> uh, you are well informed about the situation in Europe. Uh, is, do we have the same situation i in other parts of the world? So this is a similar problem all over the, the world, all, all over the globe. Well, it, it's certainly similar in terms of the health impact, although the largest, you know, the high income world, 33,000 uh, deaths in, in Europe estimated, you know, is, is a proportionally similar number of deaths in the United States. Uh, but really the, the Lancet data shows us that the great majority of the deaths from this occurring today is in the lower income parts of the world. Mm. So, so this is an issue in which there's enough of a problem for Europe and the United States and, and the other G7 countries, Canada, Japan, Italy, Germany, for the, France to lead. But the real payoff in terms of life saved is, is the entire planet, not just the high income world. Um, but maybe your question was about R&D and, and, you know, so I'll pause. No, it, it was, was just like, are there uh, or can we see any good uh, examples somewhere in the world? Because it's easier if you have someone who have succeeded, it's easier to say, if we learn from them, we can do it here too. But, but uh, I suppose we, we don't have uh, that kind oh. of examples. No, we actually do have great examples. The G7, uh, the group of seven, the seven wealthiest nations on, on the planet have been working on this issue on push and pull incentives for several years. Yeah. Uh, last year, Germany had the presidency. They specifically said that countries uh, should fund CARBEX and GARDP and SECURE, a project from the WHO, uh, so that we can complete the picture on, on push incentives. And they specifically called out for pull incentives as well. England, the UK has adopted and has a program in place with with drugs that are being reversed today two drugs uh, with a pull incentive mm. and it's it's the right size if the rest of the g7 followed proportionally with something that worked in their national systems then we'd have a solution globally on the r d equation mm. in the us this is called the pastor act it's going to be a, a valiant effort to get that passed this year Canada is studying the process. There'll be a report in September of, of this year. Japan just released information about their antibacterial pull incentive, um, which uh, is now becoming more public. And of course, we expect a proposal from the commission you know, next month, I'm told. Um, and while there's controversy of exactly how you design it, I think we have to emphasize there's consensus that it needs to be large and consistent and, and easy for the companies to understand. I guess that's going to be Christine's you know, presentation next. But, um, you know, there's a lot of movement here. This is, this is not an idea that's just kind of in somebody's head. The G7 governments are actively working on exactly this, and we just need to get it across the finish line. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. And you will come back later. Thank you so far. Uh, our last speaker is Christine Pierce from FBI. Uh, please, Christine, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm really, really glad to be talking about this very important subject today. And this is the last presentation. Uh, I want to talk about the opportunities in Europe that, uh, that are presented here in order to do something about AMR. Um, the, the speakers before me have all made it very clear what the real problem is. You have a broken market, a broken innovation ecosystem. So on the one hand, there's still a lot going on in the early stages of development, you know, and thank, thanks to some brave, brave biotech companies that are still working in that. On the other hand, there is low market attractiveness. And so the players are exiting they're not doing any R&D anymore. Some are even going bankrupt. A lot of are going bankrupt. And so there's, there's limited funding there. Uh, it, Kevin, you called it the valley of death. That's exactly what it is. But it puts the pipeline at risk, the pipeline that we need in order to get out of this, this uh, silent pandemic of AMR. So there is an urgent need, everybody agrees on that, an urgent need for meaningful new incentive models. And it's great to see the commitments that were made by the member states, by the EU. Uh, you mentioned uh, already, you know, in, in 2009, 
the council conclusion that recognized that there was this urgent need to do something about AMR and have some novel incentives in place. But indeed, we're 14 years later and nothing has happened, nothing impactful. You have two EU action plans, you have more council conclusions and a European Parliament report. It's not really doing anything. So the time to act is now. We need a meaningful EU pull incentive. And that's what I have here on the slide. I hope everybody can see this. So what is needed, what we try to put together is the criteria for such a meaningful EU pull incentive. We haven't invented that ourselves. It, this is based on, on literature, on different conclusions, uh, research from different parties. The objective for, of such a pull incentive is to drive the development of sustainable R&D for the novel antimicrobials. That's what we not want to get to. So therefore, it isn't just any pull incentive. It needs to meet criteria in order to be meaningful. And here are the key ones. So first of all, you need the, the, the pull incentive to be sizable, large enough to incentivize innovation. And Kevin named the number. It needs to, for Europe, that needs to be, represent a fair share for Europe. Uh, this, would be 39% of that bigger total of 3.1 billion per year. It needs to be delinked. It needs to be aligned to stewardship objectives. That will move the needle. But it also needs to be proportionate, proportionate as a cost to society. It needs to be predictable, predictable for all the stakeholders. So that's not just the, the in industry, but also the industry, and industry includes also the smaller biotech companies, and the payers. It needs to be feasible. That's what Kevin mentioned, it needs to be simple. Indeed, it needs to be feasible in terms of uh, the, the different competences of the players. You need to be able to do this and not depend on difficult uh, political discussions that may, may not make this possible at all. And it, but because it needs to be timely, we need to have action now. It needs, we need to have an implementation relatively quickly in the EU. And there is an opportunity because there is a review of the general pharmaceutical legislation going on now. This can be brought into this. So, and the last one is that it also needs to contribute to supp supply and availability of the antimicrobials. These are the key criteria. So any pull incentive needs to meet these criteria. We need to test them to them. And we were therefore encouraged to see that the EU is putting forward a transferable exclusivity voucher in that general pharmaceutical legislation that I just mentioned. And Christian mentioned it as well. So you can see it, this is also backed and supported by smaller companies. It's not just the, the big pharma that is inventing this because we have looked at all the options and this is the one that can make the difference. I know there is critique, but the critique, we have not seen any workable, feasible alternatives being put on the table. We're open to discuss evidence-based, other equally impactful alternatives, if there are any, but they need to be feasible and they need to come to the, to the forefront quickly. We cannot wait another 10 years or even five years before something will, will come into place. So another pilot, another study, it's, it's just not, not, this is not at the order anymore. There is an urgency and when are we going to realize that? We have an opportunity now in the general pharmaceutical legislation. What is put forward is a transferable exclusivity voucher. It could work. It, and if there are still concerns, let's talk about the design. That's the beauty of it. You can design it in order to overcome certain concerns that would be there. But non-action is not an option. Failing to act is complete failure for global health. So the time is to act now. Uh, we hope that we will hear the, the, that the policymakers will hear us and do something. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christine. How, how optimistic are you that we, in, in, uh, in a short while, will have a, uh, a new situation where we can say that now, yeah. now is the day? I'm, I am an optimistic person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I see that in the, 
that the Commission did put this forward, uh, or will put it forward, there, it was only a leaked version of, of a document that everybody has seen in the press. But so I, I hope that that, that will, will wake up uh, enough policymakers also in the countries to, to accept this, or at least then look at, at the, the proposal that will come out and, and take this as an opportunity to move forward uh, in a meaningful way and quickly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, what will happen if the, the proposal put, put forward uh, doesn't win the, the um, confidence for, from, from the market? Well, that, that, is, that is the risk. Uh, there is no alternative. Uh, the alternative is we're going to discuss a bit more, and, but then what will happen? Hmm. More companies will go bankrupt. There'll be... You know, the, well, the, the, the pipeline is drying up uh, and I don't even want to think of the disaster situation that we are creating here. So um, I don't think there is an alternative. So you ask a very good question, but that is a, a, a doom scenario that uh, I, I hope policymakers are taking their responsibility in that. Mm. We do, we do, really. Um, uh, and I think we have the opportunity to, to talk about that uh, in a few moments here. I, first of all, I would like to thank all participants for, for their opening speeches, uh, but the job um, is not yet done. Uh, we now turn to, to a panel discussion with those of you who are already participating, uh, continuing the conversation together. And uh, uh, the... Uh, the headline is uh, call to, uh, call, a call for an action. And, and uh, uh, I told you that uh, uh, when Sweden were uh, chairman for the, for the council um, many years ago, um, we had the same situation, a feeling of now is the time we have to do it. And uh, now we have spent uh, not 14 hours, but 14 years. Yes. Uh, and very few things have happened. Uh, do we have any reason to be op more optimistic today? What do you think, Christian? I, I'm actually very optimistic because you can you can see that there are now such a, you know there's a confluence of uh, very good uh, you know movements. There's uh, I think there's the there's the right uh, you know big powerful uh, parties. I think it's super cool that uh, the Swedish government is putting this as their top priority. I really think it's very uh, admirable. You see Japan, they have two priorities. One is to have more babies being born. The other one is AMR. So you, and, uh, at, at Davos, some of the leading uh, you know, uh, speeches, also uh, the, the chairman of the Novo Nordisk Foundation, Lars Reben, put this up as you know, the, 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 the biggest uh, you know, uh, health challenge. Now also a very, very powerful neighboring uh, medicinal or, or, or medicine uh, you know, society like the cancer societies, they are simply coming forward and saying, you know, 20% of all cancer patients are not dying from their cancer; they're dying from incurable infections. So, having these big, you know, allies in also in the, in the neighboring uh, medicine fields that are saying we have to do something, and so I'm very optimistic. Something will have to happen now. We have two um, uh, optimistic persons here in the in the studio. What about you, uh, Andrea? Are you optimistic about that? We in, in a short time will have a new situation. Thank you for the question. Well, we, we have to be optimistic, uh, given the scale of the threat and given how much consensus there is in the global community, industry, patient representatives, stakeholders, KOL and, and, and policymakers, that something needs to happen. And we also have not only the motivation and the awareness of the, the problem, but the opportunity, as Christine was saying, especially in Europe, but also in other areas of the world. Therefore, I really just call on all stakeholders to work together to find workable solutions that are sustainable, predictable, uh, so that in the long term we really get this ecosystem uh, and this pipeline up and running again. Mm. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, what about you, Kevin? Do, do you think we have a reason to be optimistic or what will happen if we don't succeed this time either? Uh, there's a lot of things that have happened in the past 14 years, uh, even in the past uh, six or seven years since the last UN General Assembly high-level meeting, uh, we've created a lot of push incentives. CARB-X didn't exist. Uh, we have $800 million that's been donated to us. CARB-P didn't exist. 
the AMR Action Fund, over a billion dollars from industry, that's new. The, the uh, Repair Impact Fund from the Novo Nordisk uh, Foundation, that, that's new. Uh, the, the fact that the United Kingdom has an, a functioning pull incentive and that it's on the agenda and moving forward with other G7 countries, all of that is highly encouraging. But um, I, I will say that if somebody c listens to this and decides, well, I agree that there's a pull incentive that's needed, but but I hear complaints about the transfer exclusivity voucher and what we need is another study. Um, I'm a professor and, and every article ends with more research needed, but I'm gonna tell you, we do not need to study this anymore. Um, uh, we, we have all the information we have we need in order for Europe and for the United States and for the G7 countries to make choices on how to design a pool incentive that works in your context. And and it, the time now is now to move on that because uh, I showed you the slide of the 90 some, something companies and the great majority of them very small. Uh, they can't just sit and, and hold their breath for two or three or four years while debate happens, uh, they either go forward or they go bankrupt. And, and, or they change and decide to give up on antibiotics and, and to work on cancer. So, you know, waiting is not an option. And we have all the information we need in order to make good choices now. And so I'm grateful that the proposal is coming forward. I've actually published twice you know, critiques of, of this idea. And I, I think, you know, a, a healthy discussion is good, but uh, the option of coming out of it with no pull incentive should be off the table. Thank you very much, Kevin. Um, and you will come back later. Uh, I have a, a question um, and anyone who wants to, to answer is, is welcome to do so. Uh, the question is, does the transferable uh, voucher mean that European patient will have to pay additional approximately 10 billion eu uh, euro for the access to other already very expensive medicines per year? So I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll try to start with yeah. that and uh, anyone can jump in. So uh, we have done a study in, because of course you, you, there is it, it, any pull incentive is going to have a cost, yeah? And here you, you add uh, some exclusivity to an existing product, so it will, the, the, the generics and the biosimilars uh, will come later on the market. But we looked at the cost, so we calculated the cost over 10 years, and we also compa compared it with the benefits that this gives, and, and the, the benefits far outweigh the costs. That's one thing. The, the amount that, that is mentioned here uh, is, is, is an exaggeration because you actually have to look at the, the kind of products that the, the amount is based on a certain uh, product that has already gone off patent. So that is no longer a product that would be uh, the one that could, uh, where a, a transferable exclusivity could be attached to. So we need to look in the future to what kind of products could uh, the, tre the transferable exclusivity be attached to? And that's the kind of products that we have taken in our study to calculate how much would it cost. Also, what you need to take into account is it's not the price of that product. It, it needs to be the, the impact of not having immediately a generic or a biosimilar coming on the market. And uh, what is often forgotten is that you don't immediately, after the loss of exclusivity, the generics or biosimilars do not take the full market. So it's, it's, you still have the originator and the generic or biosimilar together on the market. And that's, so, so it's only a smaller percentage of that. Plus, you need to take into account not the, the, the list price, but also the, the rebates. Uh, it, so it's, it's, the amount is not as high as, as is mentioned there. Uh, it will be a lot less. We have calculated that. And, and <laughs> again, we need, it's a small price to pay for, for products that are going to, to save our modern medicine. Because that, that's, that's the thing, you need antibiotics. Every patient will need that. Every patient will benefit from that. So um, yeah, I, I think uh, it's, it's, uh, this is why we, we need to be very careful in, in, uh, in how we, we calculate this, be, be understanding what the real impact is. We've done that. 
So it is feasible to, uh, uh, yeah, to do something that, it is, that is proportionate, that is predictable, uh, that is value for money, all, all of the things that come under the, the, the key um, uh, criteria that we set for, for the, uh, the pool incentive. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone who, who wants to add something, uh, the time is running very quickly, but do you want to add yeah, something? Yeah, just Christian? to add sort of the, in the perspective of if you, I think if you ask the European taxpayers or yeah. the American taxpayers, you know, would you want to spend a few dollars per year? That's what we're talking about. Yeah. If you are 400 million Europeans yeah. or 300 million Americans to ensure that there is uh, you know, safe and efficacious antibiotics to your children and to your grandchildren. I would predict most taxpayers will say, get on with it. Mm. And I think, you know, if you look at the concept of a patent, it's already a contract between an innovator and society. You innovate, you get exclusivity, and then you get it out to the whole society. Th this is actually the same. We will just use that concept of, you know, these innovators in AMR, where the you know, business model is broken, let's make a contract, let's make those medicine happen, and then give it out to, uh, again, you know, when, when, once uh, you know, patent has, uh, has run out. So it's exactly the same concept that we've used for several hundred years of a patent between innovators and society. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anything you want to, to add, Andrea? Yeah, I think Christina said it all, really. Uh, we, we, know, we know the extent of the challenge. We know the amount that is needed to move the needle in terms of R&D. We just need to decide how to design something that works for Europe and other areas of the world, other jurisdictions might have other models that uh, fit with their own legal uh, systems and policy systems. So therefore, uh, I, would, I would just say, uh, the time is really now for to, to act with this opportunity of the of the revision of the EU pharma legislation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin. We have to be practical. Um, this will be paid for through taxes in the U.S. Pasteur Act, and probably the same way in Canada if that goes forward. And certainly, it was centrally paid by the government in 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 the U.K. And I understand that that's what will happen in Japan as well. But but in Europe. Uh, the commission lacks the competence to, you know, it's not allowed to to directly influence the health budgets of the 27 member states. They can't commit. And so the idea of trying to create a, a pull incentive in 27 different European states, one by one by one, that doesn't fulfill the criteria of getting this done quickly. And so, you know, part of the reason why transferable exclusivity is being put forward is that it's something the commission actually has the power to do. And if, uh, if folks don't like that idea, I, I would love to hear ideas of other things the commission can do as opposed to the 27 member states uh, that's uh, just as good or better. And I think that would be a great discussion. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, for contributing to, to this uh, discussion. And I'm sure the discussion will continue. Uh, and it had to continue because this is of, of uh, uh, utmost uh, importance, of course. Uh, and we have a situation where we have um, the revision of the pharmaceutical legislation um, um, uh, here in a very short time. And through vehicles uh, such like the council recommendations on AMR, both proposals uh, expected to be presented uh, on March 28th uh, and the European Union have a once uh, in a generation opportunity uh, to put forward uh, and put the right conditions uh, into place. Um, we have listened to the call for actions from actors along the R&D pipeline for uh, uh, antimicrobials and uh, we have agreed th uh, that actions are needed urgently. Uh, we have waited for many years and uh, quite frankly we cannot uh, wait any longer. Patients uh, across the globe need to know that effective antibiotics are available and to secure that uh, research and development incentives must be in place. Uh, with that, I would like to conclude by thanking uh, all participants and, of course, all of you who have followed the discussions, uh, which we hope uh, will contribute to increase knowledge and involvement in a topic that can rightly be called a matter of destiny. Thank you for today. Thank you. Thank you.